<laughs> so today we're going to talk about some beads and we can't hardly mention the beads without mentioning some quills but we will for Kim's sake spend <clears throat> most of our time this evening talking about the beads and I don't know how many people have noticed but from day one the graphics that are on here I used one of our wampum belts that we'll talk about a little bit later mm -hmm. and this wampum belt has graced the the presentations since October and here we've come almost full circle and we're going to talk a little bit about that belt at the end of the presentation. So to jump in here and begin with <clears throat> a few of our little objectives and it's kind of skimpy. Um, we're going to talk about beads and quills. That's pretty much it. When Kim and I at the first of the year were talking about doing this topic, I kind of thought to myself, okay, um, it's just like well, beads are beads, right? And Ooh. I'd done a lot of research and I haven't found a whole lot of information about our beads, nor a lot of information about our quills. So I was kind of perplexed as to how we could kind of do a topic on beads and quills. So you'll see down here at the bottom, another one of my little disclaimers. If I use any material that is not here on Wyandotte in origin, I'll always point it out. And to supplement and give us a little bit more background on beads, there's going to, going to be a few things in here that will complement what we're going to talk about on some wine dot beads. So I like quotes. <clears throat> and this quote here to begin with is going to kind of set the tone for what we're talking about. And this is a gentleman by the name of Walter Williams. He has a very extensive collection of some ancient beads. And he made the statement in one of his writings that the beads, the bead was the most ubiquitous item made for adornment throughout Amaranth history. And once we start looking at the beads, we can see that his statement there is so very, very true. Beads go back to the very beginning of time. And beads consisted of many, many different things. Uh, you can see here, in the little picture that I've put in, this is a little necklace made by some ancients here in North America, where they took, took um, use of some fossilized crinoid stems. And here in Southwest Missouri with the Ozark Mountains, there's crinoid stems everywhere. And as a younger kid, when we walked in and out of some of these incredible hills that we have to live with. I will admit that I made some necklaces myself from these crinoid stems because they're so easy to pick up. You just poke the little metal hole out, put them on a string and boom, you have something pretty cool. So when you have a bunch of ancient Indians walking around, they see something like that. They used items that was easy to, to gain and easy to manipulate, but they made necklaces. They made all kinds of things that we'll talk about here on the next slide, out of seeds, uh, freshwater pearls, saltwater pearls, shells, stones, teeth, horns, antler, bones, <laughs> balls of all kinds, uh, pottery shards, uh, copper was something that was commonly used uh, throughout a lot of North America, wood items, and something that was kind of unique, corn kernels have been found that was used to make necklaces because some of the corn that we think of today, uh, you go to the store, you buy your corn, it's just, you know, the plain old big old ears of yellow corn. But some of the ancient uh, varieties of the Indian corn was incredible in color. And they would use the corn kernels for necklaces and earrings and other forms of adornment. But basically anything that would accommodate the making of a whole was game for any type of a bead. And you notice that I have on here imperfect beads. None of these beads that they would have initially used way back when would have been perfect. So they added to the design, they added to the style, and we'll see some old necklaces here in a little bit. 
and they were just amazing in the in the creativity that was used to create some of these items, these artifacts. I think it was last week we had talked about one of our medicine bags, <clears throat> and this is a a medicine bag uh, from the Sock and Fox that is made from an uncut otter skin. I chose this to kind of complement some of the things that we talked about, I think it was last week, about the medicine bags, how some of our ancient medicine bags were the uncut, uh, unblemished skins of some of the animals. Sock and Fox here went to some extremes and they embellished this otter, this medicine bag, with a lot of beads. So this is kind of a newer uh, artifact that the Sock and Fox have made. And you can see that they use some some pretty good embellishments to embellish uh, the otter skin. But beads were used by the men and the women for necklaces, ankle and arm bands, ear and nose jewels. They were woven into the ladies' hair. The men wore some beads in their own hair. Uh, a lot of different types of beads were sewn onto the clothing. We've talked a little bit about that in some past discussions. Um, Beads were sewn on implements of husbandry and war. They were used for diplomacy. Beads were used for tribal politics, clan politics, and something unique to the Iroquoian people. Beads were used as a means to show one's personal wealth. Not a lot of the other nations out there would have expressed a sense of personal wealth, but the Iroquoian people did show the differences in the individuals within the nation that had a lot of wealth and a lot of notoriety of that wealth. Uh, beads, as we talked about a couple of sessions back, paint was omnipresent. Uh, an, an individual didn't hardly step outside of the longhouse or the lodge without their paint. And in many ways, very similar were the beads. A lot of the individuals within the Wyandotte Nation would not have left their, their lodge or their longhouse without wearing some form of a bead. They were omnipresent, pretty much just in the same respect as what the paint was. And like the paint, the beads were a lot more important for personal adornment than were feathers. Here are some interesting necklaces that go back basically to the times maybe before we were actually a nation. These beads were collected like the number one, if we start here from the left and we go from left to right, beads here on number one and number three came out of Oklahoma from the spiral mounds. The one in the middle with the um, teeth actually came out of Tennessee and this is an interesting necklace here, an example of a necklace from Tennessee out in the middle of the Great Island. And the beads that are surrounding these teeth are actually whelk. This is wampum that goes back um, thousands of years. And the beads next to it is coming out, as I said, out of Spyro mounds. And the last one over on the right are beads made of copper. And these copper beads actually came out of Kentucky. They were able to mine beads or they were able to mine copper out of Kentucky. And obviously uh, North America is known for the copper that came out of the Great Lakes area. But these beads here being copper came out of Kentucky. So these are some samples of some imperfect prehistoric beads. And I think they are, they are very, reflective of some very highly skilled, very decorative items. I like the imperfectness of it. And here are some perfect beads, some of recent times. Uh, these are some that were taken by Barbeau when he came to Oklahoma in 1911, 1912, back to Canada. And these are Kate Johnson, Maggie Coon, Becky Duchesne, and they show, show some of the more recent styles and designs of some beads that were used as recently as the last 120 years. Another little quote. With noteworthy ingenuity, the Indians developed an almost endless variety of objects 
calling for the use of trade beads, both for personal adornment and for the ornamentation of ceremonial and unitarian articles. So trade beads, when they came into North America, almost immediately with European contact, changed a lot of things. When the Europeans came over, they immediately noticed the importance of the beads. So they began to trade the beads from Europe. Beads came from primarily out of France, Italy, uh, what is today the Czech Republic, and they were mass produced in glass and porcelain. This little board over here to the side shows just a small sampling, and we'll see a little bit more of some of these trade beads here on the next slide, but you can see how they would have caught the attention of all the different nations. Different sizes, different colors, different shapes. Um, they would have just been a wow factor that was almost um, an addiction to the Indians. They just loved their beads and these complemented everything that they were doing and they were just instantly put into the, the designs of the, the clothing and everything else that they wore. Uh, the beads, seed beads, pony beads, the tubular beads and the wampum beads were some of the, the four most popular types of beads. And we'll talk about each here in just a bit. Um, the pony beads are some that we use quite a bit at the gathering of little turtles. They're gonna be the larger type beads, a little bit easier to handle. Kids are quick to grab those and actually string them up on a strand. But for the people way back when, those beads were useful, but they weren't really practical. They were too big for anything that they could have actually worn and used, except for just sewn on embellishments to some of their clothing because those beads came in a size that averaged anywhere from six to nine millimeters in diameter, which that's pretty good size. That's a pretty chunky bead. And the name for the pony beads was actually given to them in the way in which the beads made their way across North America on the back of pack animals. So the pack animals walked into the villages and they were given the name pony beads because they came off the back of the ponies when the traders came into town. Some of the original and the most sought after beads were the seed beads. And the seed beads get their name from what you would think would be an actual seed, which is true. The original seed beads were organic and they were from and found within nature. Various type of small seeds were used. They were sewn into garments. They were used for embellishments. They were tiny, but they were powerful in the way that they could actually express an individual's creativity. The seed beads, once they started coming over from Europe, uh, initially didn't hit too many of the different nations because they came in kind of slow and they just kind of trickled across the continent. They were anywhere from 1.3 to 4 millimeters in size, which would have been right within that, that range of size for most of the seeds that the, the different nations were pulling out in nature. The seed beads were the most usable and they were the most prized beads that they were given through trade. But unfortunately, most of the seed beads really didn't become available to the nations until the mid 1840s. But once they actually started coming in, they hit the nations by the millions almost, and then they just spread across the, the continent in a very feasting, fibrous way. Beads here uh, show a little bit more of the variety of the beads that came across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. Again, the shapes, the sizes, the colors. Um, some of these down here on the bottom right actually have like stars and moons in them, which would have been very appealing to some of the nations with a lot of their uh, different oral traditions. But these beads were just, they were addictive to the nations. Here are some other samples of some of our recent bead work. And the one that I like here is Maggie Coons. If you look at her piece of art, it's perfectly imperfect. And two, she is using a variety, many different styles of beads. She has got some seed beads on here. She's got some pony beads. She has some tubular beads. 
the thing that caught my attention is the little fringe down at the bottom. Those look like some actual silver. Uh, silver beads were used. And in the middle of those silver beads, she's got some yellow that she's put in there. And if you notice, there's some down right in the area here that are kind of a green that almost look like turquoise. So it makes me wonder if she ran out of beads and she just threw some in there to finish up her piece or if she did that on purpose. Because you know, we're not really supposed to make something perfect because we are imperfect people and anything we make can't be perfect. So I've wondered if that's her way of, of weaving into her pieces of art a little bit of imperfection. And if you notice right there, there's an awkward little bead stuck right in the middle of that little blue star. So that is a, an amazing little piece of work there. And then Becky has got the seed beads there on the top and then some pony beads and the other one down at the bottom. This is one of my favorite quotes that I've found over the years. And it speaks volumes as to who our grandmas and grandpas were and what the people that met them thought of them. And it says they, referencing the Wyandotte, were considered the richest and most industrious Indians on the continent. Mr. McKee told Governor Simcoe that when he first became acquainted with these people, which was around 1750, they would frequently change their dresses eight or 10 times in the course of an evening when holding one of their grand dances. And that each dress was so loaded with ornaments as to be valued at 40 to 50 pounds each. When we do the math on that, we go back to the the value of the currency back in 1750, and we imply inflation, and we convert it, from, convert it from pound to dollar. It's an amazing amount of money that these dresses would have been at the time. 40 to 50 pounds back then is equal to about 12 to $15,000 each. So our ladies, they dressed to impress. These Dresses would have been loaded with beads. They would have been loaded with porcupine quill. They would have had all kinds of silver embellishments. The cloth would have been the richest that they could have got. They were just loaded with some amazing detail, amazing wealth. And that is who our grandmas and our grandpas were. When they dressed and they danced and they celebrated everything that the I'm, I'm going to kind of pause when I use this term because we didn't have such a term, but when they, when they celebrated at the, the feast and they gave honor to the blessings of the different spirits, they did not hold back because the spirits did not hold back in the blessings that they provided to the people and the people honored that with extravagant displays of wealth because they were a wealthy people in more ways than what we can imagine today. It was a hard time for them back then, but they celebrated and they celebrated in grand style the blessings that they were given by the spirits. Knowing that, wampum beads would have been an expression of that wealth because the wampum beads were the most prized beads that could be had back in the day. Oddly enough, the original wampum beads, and we're using that term basically from the, the shape, the tubular shape that we're familiar with in the wampum beads. The original wampum beads would have been something as basic as little painted tubes of wood. Because prior to European contact, wampum shells were rather rare across the Great Island. When the wampum shells were made. They were made from the whelk and from the quahog, sea snails and clams that came out of basically from the Chesapeake Bay area up through New England. And the Algonquian tribes that lived on the coast, they had a monopoly on the making of these wampum beads. And as the Algonquian ladies were sitting there making the beads, they could only make up to about six beads a day. So it was a tremendous amount of labor for them to actually make the beads. 
because of that, the, the value of these beads, especially the purple beads, was tremendous. The wampum beads came in all shapes and sizes, and they were handmade, and they were like all good beads. They were imperfect. They were never perfect in size. They were never perfect in shape, which added to their value. Because of the rarity of the wampum beads, uh, our grandmas and grandpas, all of the Iroquoian nations, they sought after them, they were highly prized, and they were of extreme value. When the Europeans came over, primarily the Dutch and the English, they met the Algonquian tribes on the East Coast, and they noticed how they were busy at making these wampum beads, and they kind of thought, eh, I kind of like that. So the Dutch and the English began to trade and basically buy up all of the shells that the Algonquians had. Then the English and the Dutch would take all these shells back to Europe where they would use some modern technologies and they would begin to mass produce wampum beads. They would in turn bring these beads that were mass produced in Europe out of the shells. And then they would saturate the markets with these beads. The nations would just pounce on these beads. They loved them. The Europeans noticed how much those beads were coveted, so they began to make some fake beads. They began to make these beads out of glass and out of porcelain, and those were readily accepted among the nations, but they didn't have the same value as the original shell beads, but they were adopted and they were used within the designs of all the different nations. The glass and the porcelain beads are the more common type of beads that you see in many of the wampum belts. The strands of wampum beads were more popular than the belts because of the value and the rarity of the beads. So you have these wampum strands that would signify an individual's credentials the position within the tribe, the clan, the nation that an individual had. They would also be bestowed for honorary purposes, showing signs of authority. And like our grandmas and grandpas, they would from time to time wear strands of wampum beads to signify their personal wealth. The strands of beads were used for communication, diplomacy, from clan to clan and tribe to tribe and nation to nation. In time, as these wampum beads became saturated throughout North America, the wampum belts began to supplement and eventually replace the beads for diplomacy. And also, as we know, the wampum belts became to preserve tribal histories. One color was reserved for the wampum strands in the belts. The color red was used exclusively on the strands and the belts for declarations of war. The color red that would be used within uh, the strands and the belts could not be used on anything else because any nation that saw it knew that there was a problem potentially coming their way. Case in point, when we moved from Kansas, or not Kansas, but Ohio and Michigan, and moved to Kansas, uh, we quickly called together the Confederacy of Nations from the Northeast. All the old nations came together uh, we were reaffirmed as keepers of the council fire, the head of the nations. And one nation was in attendance that did not initially belong to the initial confederacy, if you will, of nations from the Northeast. It was the Fox. The Fox were living just a little bit north of us in Kansas, and they came and they crashed our meeting. And during that meeting, some of the old wampum belts were pulled out. And one of the belts that was pulled out was one of the war belts. And the Wyandots and the Fox had really not quite found peace among the nations. And they were, we were still technically at war. And one of the belts that was pulled out had a red tomahawk beaded right in the middle of the belt. When the Fox saw that, uh, they were gone. They kind of thought that we were pulling that belt out to give it to them because uh, we were still at war. So that red color of the tomahawk in the belt spoke volumes that all nations knew, and it was not used with, with any type of, of frivolousy. Otis Shoshone strands. 
Chris and I was talking several months ago about strands uh, for the Wyandot people. And we have some strands. Um, most of those have been rebeaded by Mary Walker. So they would not have been some of the original strands that we have. Uh, Bert has been keeper of many of those strands and now the nation has been blessed with some of those in the museum. But the original strands that we had way back when are all gone. I don't know of any examples that exist even in the museums across the nation. These are Haudenosaunee and they show the different variety of strands. These strands were used for communication. They were used for relaying of messages uh, like the one over here on the left with the, the wooden handle. This one was an invitation to come and actually participate in a council meeting. And the notched piece of wood, each notched indicated the number of days from when this strand was delivered to a clan, uh, how many days they had before they had to present themselves at the council. Each one of these little loops that you see down here on the ends of the strands were different colors, and the different colors added different meaning to each of the strands themselves. The ones over to the right, these are indicating with all the dark purple beads, this is indicating the death of one of the chiefs. So everybody knew what the, the strands and the different configuration of colored beads would have represented. And then in addition to speak more, uh, the little tails were added later on. And these are Haudenosaunee. The new corn belt. Has everybody seen this at the museum? This is actually in Wyandotte. Uh, the nation was given the opportunity to purchase this back in, when was it, 2017, I believe. And it now resides and will forever reside in the nation's archives there at the museum. This belt is one of two. There is another duplicate of this belt. And when I was in Cincinnati at Xavier University, I was asking Dr. Tiaro, who is um, uh, an, an expert on some of the original Catholic uh, ceremonies and, and meetings that were done within the nations. I asked him where it was, and he believes that the, the, the mate of this belt is actually in Ottawa. And to get it would take a lot of work because it's deep buried in the Catholic who knows where archives. But this belt symbolizes the establishment of the Wyandots at Fort Detroit in 1701. This belt was given to the nation in 1701. And it symbolizes us coming to Detroit. And it also symbolizes the Catholics in establishing our new corn feast on August 15th. And a lot of people are surprised to find out that our new corn feast was established on that day by the Catholics. And this belt celebrates the coming of the Wyandotte people, the Huron people then, into the Catholic Church. And it's setting in Wyandotte, Oklahoma today. William Orchard, who is an expert on beads and quills, made a statement in 1929. Prior to the use of beads as a form of embellishment, Porcupine quills dyed in various colors were applied with unsurpassed workmanship to garments and ornaments producing exquisite designs. Long before the beads became as ornamental as they were with the seed beads, it was this little fella right here that provided and produced some of the product of what become some absolutely amazing works of art. This little guy, uh, as you can see, my little inset down at the bottom, uh, the porcupine was to the Indians what the beaver was to the Europeans. This guy was hunted. He was sought. There would have been nations that crossed the, the whole of the North American continent to get one thing, his quills. Because his quills were used prior to the beads as the original and traditional choice of our grandmas and grandpas for making embellishments on their clothing, uh, for embellishments on their accessories and their implements. Uh, the porcupine quill 
much like the imperfect beads, adorned everything. However, and this is something that we always have to remember, remember those dresses that we were talking about earlier, the value of them, the amount of, of wealth that were uh, Im embedded in each one of those dresses. The porcupine quills were not something that would have been worn on a daily basis in many of the daily activities of our grandmas and grandpas. The quill work was too intricate. It was too valuable to be used on everyday pieces of clothing for tending the garden or chasing the whitetail through the forest. They would have been reserved for those special occasions when they were dressing to impress and to reflect the blessings of the spirits. Uh, the porcupine quills were flattened and colored for brilliant expressions of creativity and expense. Unlike with the beads, the quills were produced exclusively by the women. Only the women, uh, the examples that I've seen, only the women would do the quill work. In 1749, George Loskill, uh, who was a Moravian missionary, uh, was also uh, very well versed on the traditions of the different nations. He had made a statement that the Indians pay great attention to their dress and ornaments in which indeed they display much singularity, but little art. William, William Orchard said, mm, uh-uh, no. Um, a lot of the quill work that the nations produced and the nations from the East Coast to the West Coast, many of the nations produced some phenomenal pieces of quill work that were included among the fine arts. Uh, they are some incredible works of art. Case in point, here are two moccasins. And does anybody know to whom these moccasins belong? Give you a little clue that both of these moccasins are of Huron design. The moccasin on the left, does anybody know who designed and, and created that piece of art? Anybody want to take a guess? What about this one over here? Look at the style of the moccasin. Does anybody recognize the style of moccasin right here? Well, on the left, it's more with the vamp that we didn't really have too much. That's more um Iroquois like Iroquois confes confederacy more yeah this one over here is actually is actually wind at this okay. came out of came out of Lorette this one over here what type of toe is that pucker toe that's a pucker toe uh this set of moccasins here I found this picture um within the archives of the CMC and it was collected somewhere around 1780. And this is one of the oldest examples that I know of that shows some of our quill work, because that is labeled as a Huron. Uh, that is a Wyandotte pair of moccasins. And it goes back to about 1780, shows the pucker toe and the moccasins that was the style that we wore. It shows the, the quill work on the lacing on the pucker toe. It also shows down along the side of the, the quill work on the side, some moose hair <clears throat> that had been dyed. So this one over here is Wendat. This one here is Wyandotte. One of the that oldest, one. yeah. The one on the, the red one, the one on the left, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, had, I happened to Google quill work while you were talking. That one shows up as the top image on Wikipedia. And what did they say it is? Huron. Huron, correct. Um, Wendat is Huron. Wyandotte is Huron. There are many nations that were Huron. We have to be able to understand what is Huron Wyandotte and Huron Wendat. So like I say here, they are both Huron designs. So yes, I agree. The one on the left and the one on the right, they're both Huron. I just think it's interesting that that photo, did you pull it from Wikipedia or is it just a- No, I, I never use it. Coincidence. <laughs> yeah, coincidence. No, I personally will never use anything from Wikipedia. That's what I guessed. Yeah, never. 
Um, I dig stuff out of archives that like the, the moccasin here on the right, our moccasin out of the CMC archives. Because those I can pretty much have faith to trust in what they're saying is true. Wikipedia, I wouldn't give them a dime for anything they say. Because read the history of the wind up people on there. Yeah. Okay, quickly moving on, because we could talk about that for a long time. Here is another amazing piece of artwork. And this one is also here on Windat. This is phenomenal craftsmanship. The quill work on this, the use of the moose hair, uh, that is museum quality right there. And that goes to show the extent of the creativity, the extent of the craftsmanship, because the craftsmanship and the skill that it took to make that, and if you look at it, I know we, we say that we don't make perfect pieces, but my, that is, you can just stare at that all day and just be amazed at the quality of the craftsmanship and the artistic skill it took to make that piece of art. That's phenomenal. A point of interest in connection with the habitat of the porcupine is the fact that this animal is not found in the country inhabited by those tribes which are today and have been in the past the producers of great quantities of porcupine quill embroidery. This may indicate that our Indian friends, interesting expression there, like white people, desired the things most difficult to obtain for their personal adornment. What Mr. Orchard is saying there is that there are a number of nations that used the porcupine quill for some extravagant displays on their garments and their implements, but the little porcupine did not live in the area where they lived. So they went to great extremes to traverse the great island looking for the porcupine to harvest his quills so that they could be transported back in many cases over hundreds of miles so that the women could actually use his quills her quills for the pieces of art that they produced. In the same manner, after we left Ohio and Michigan, because the porcupine is not truly native to Ohio, but it is obviously native to Michigan. We had a, a fairly good supply of porcupines that we could obtain prior to leaving Michigan and Ohio. But once we actually moved to Indian territory that became the state of Kansas, the porcupine didn't live there. That was not a natural abode uh, of his habitat. So once we actually left Ohio and Michigan, we went to Kansas as it became in time. The procurement of the porcupine quills became difficult. And because of reestablishing ourselves in Kansas and re re-expressing ourselves as a people, the porcupine quill work just kind of faded away. It became a forgotten art. And about that same time, if you can remember in the mid to 1840s is when the seed beads started coming in. So the seed beads out of convenience began to replace the porcupine quill as the choice in which to make the fine pieces of embroidered beadwork that we see today. And not to say anything that would be taken wrong, but today we have one of the greatest beaters I think that we've ever seen within the nation today with us in, the, in, the, in this little gathering. Uh, Kim, she's got some phenomenal works of art and I think they can stand toe to toe with anything that grandmas and grandpas would have produced 100, 200, 300 years ago. So kudos to Kim for taking- in art Good job, Kim. <laughs> and continuing to uh, carry on the tradition of the ancestors. Thank I look you. forward to someday in the near future, uh, somebody actually stepping up and rebringing back into the nation porcupine quill work. It's uh, in that, the works. It's in the works. It is. I promise. Yeah. That was my question, actually. At one point, I bought quills and I couldn't figure out how to do it. I've got a book that Mr. Orchard had produced back in 1916 that I'm gonna to send to Kim. And he has meticulously 
examined a lot of quill work and he's produced this book that shows all the different types of stitching that goes back to the early days, three, four, five hundred years ago, when some of the examples that they've collected are studied. So I'm going to send it to Kim that has all the different types of stitching, all the different ways in which they have found traditionally that the quills would have been actually adhered to the different product that they used. And just quickly skimming through it like I have, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing what they could have done 300 years ago with some of these quills. And we know good and well that some of our people, <clears throat> not to mention <clears throat> Marilyn by name, um, but some of our people do not need to be handling quills because they can be a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous thing. Oh, maybe oh, no. I can look really. at that book in yeah. September. I saw that oh. porcupine picture and I was like, oh, stay away. <laughs> yeah. So as I've always done, here are some of the sources that have been used to uh, collect some of this data. And I encourage everybody to take advantage of these sources and I tell you where they come from. Uh, so take advantage, download some of this. I've got, I've got lots of this stuff. And it's time that a lot of people start sharing the, the knowledge because there's some good stuff in these books, some pamphlets, books, a lot of different varieties of things. So we are done with August. That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> We're going to talk about it? Sure. <laughs> this is where Kim steps in because right. she's, the, she's the beater. Well, uh, just to remind everybody, if you didn't know, my name... My Wanda name is Tetsi Tarat, which means she puts beads in. So it's so important to me that I asked for my Wanda name to include something like that. And I was granted that. So um, I'm, it means a lot to me. Um, one thing I want to, if you could go down to that picture, um, Ms. Coons, um, in it, like the bag that you were saying had silver on the bottom. That's yeah, a, that so it's a, it's a wall embellishment that they would have right. put stuff on, okay. on the wall. Yeah. Some you, they'd use this a lot of times to put a pair of scissors in, or depending on how big it was, they'd even put like broom handles in it or something like that. Mm -hmm. But what is so significant about that piece is the style of bead work, not just the beads, but the bead work. It has the, it looks like a braid around there. That is actually raised beadwork. And um, that is a technique that is primarily used in Iroquoian culture that all of the other, it seems like all of the other um, styles of beadwork, like on the left with Becky Duchesne's work, that's loom beading. Um, that has been shared throughout the continents i mean that is a style that's all over but that with that braided raised bead technique right there yeah you the can edge. see it yeah you can see it right down here what kim's talking about you can see it here in this corner and you can yeah. see it right down here on the bottom yeah. it's it's a little hard to see but when you look for it you can see what she's talking about yeah, there and, and once that, you see it, well, it even the gold beads in the center mm -hmm. of that that braid it looks like a braid um, that is a style, I don't know why, but that's a style that has not been passed throughout the country or throughout the continents, that it has stayed primarily with Iroquoian people. And um, whenever I started learning raised beadwork, I was like kind of a little pressed trying to find that, uh, that example in Wandop work, not just Iroquoian, just to, like I wanted to prove that we did it as well. And then whenever we went to Ohio, one of the times I saw some bags that had that on there and I was just, yes, yes, it, it, it was our style. We did use it. Um, they did use it a lot in uh, like the Nicar Ni Niagara Falls um, for uh, tourism. They would make these wall embellishments a lot and they would use that to, they made a lot of money actually. Um, not the wind outs, the, um, what's the T? Tuscarora. Tuscarora, yeah. They're the ones that did that a lot in Niagara Falls, those wall embellishments like that. But 
um, it's just significant to notice that that style of beadwork has not been passed around um, that often, but it has been that it has stayed with Iroquoian people, and that's significant for us. Um, and I know that's like my nerdy beading thing coming out that I'm so excited to see this piece, but I just wanted to point that out for everybody else. Yeah. And Kim, Maggie, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, Kim, you were talking about the the brown, it looks like brown, that circle. That's yeah. the beading you were talking about? Yeah. The, yeah, it's kind of brownish gold, like yeah. Yeah. color. Yeah. yeah. It I like sure. the and what's funny, right now there was like some TikTok, Facebook drama recently. Um, if you follow the beading community in those communities um, or on the socials, um, there's a beater who I really do enjoy watching her, but she was saying how she invented this style mm. of beading back in 19 oh. or in 2014 and how other people are using this style and they need to credit her and then everybody came back at her and was like dude no you didn't it's <laughs> oh it was Shoni and everybody you can't take credit for this and then she was just like so she she did apologize and she said oh my bad i i'm sorry i i didn't understand but i thought for some reason, she thought she um, that she invented that beating technique, but wow. I thought, yeah, yeah, I could imagine that conversation. Yeah, and Maggie, Maggie gave Barbeau several samples similar to this one here, and when you look at them, they look to be maybe a little bit better in their design and their quality of work, but like yeah. Kim's pointed out, I chose this one. Even though down here it's missing some beads and stuff, which we don't know if that's purposeful or not, or if it's just a reflection of the age of that. But that piece right there is a phenomenal piece of art that was made in Wyandotte, Oklahoma, 1911-1912. It. it looks like the stitches are broken. So it, you know, right down in when you yeah. right there in the lower in the in the um on that right hand side at the See lower of four strands coming look out. like broken stitches. Yeah. So I would imagine that at one time that went all the way up. I used to do a whole lot of embroidery and this this um, rope stitch reminds me of the feather stitch in embroidery. I don't know if there's a um, um, a point where the beady, the beaters and the embroiders ever hooked up at a, a conference in 1491. 1491. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious about the similarity of the, of the look. That's amazing. I agree. It looks a lot like embroidery too. Mm -hmm. And once Kim started talking about um, this time the raised beading and I really started looking at it I'm fascinated by it and would love to have the time to really really learn how to do it I've practiced but yeah it just doesn't happen but there's a I have a favorite person on Facebook that does does it and I just I stare at her work and just am amazed Kim, is each bead locked down with its own stitch? No, not with the raised beadwork that they do. They usually, they do, it depends on the beater, but mm -hmm. um, usually four to eight beads at a time, whatever mm -hmm. they feel. And it looks like probably that one is maybe six or seven. Mm -hmm. um, and they, the intention is to make it a 3D appearance. So right. it's right. actually up a little bit sometimes some mm -hmm. beaters put like a line of beads underneath there to cause like a bump and then right. they over that but that's just kind of different techniques what different people use but um on other types of bead embroidery um the flat bead embroidery they do tack down every it depends on the beater like i tack down every two beads but that's pretty um anal <laughs> some people mm -hmm. tack down like every four or five beads, something like that. 
it's just the the more the smaller amount of beads that you tack down at once the nicer it looks the flatter it is and so um you'll just get different outcomes with how how many you tack down at once so if you can picture those dresses the 40 50 pound back in the day expensive dresses they probably would have incorporated this type of beadwork on them and this is something that would have been absolutely phenomenal and amazing to the europeans as they watched dress after dress after dress come out of these these what would have been shanties to them these log cabins and these lodges where did these people put this stuff where do they accumulate such a a, a wealth of, of artifacts so when they came over and they saw what the Wyandotte people was producing and how extravagantly they they gave honor back to the spirits this is what they were wearing this is the type of of artwork that they adorn themselves with the best the greatest that they could produce and that was the only thing that was within their ability to do was to do the best that they could and because of that they didn't wear this type of embellishment on the clothing that they would have worn on a daily basis it was just too rich it was too extravagant did they wear some of it yeah but a lot of it wouldn't have been to the extremes that would have been the 40 to 50 pound dresses makes you wonder what the men wore nothing <laughs> well at the celebrations yeah they, they would have worn something that would have been inappropriate kim <laughs> but when the when grandmas and grandpas did dress um i state several times in book number two that when they dressed they dressed to impress they went as extravagant as they possibly could and then on the opposite extreme to go and do the daily chores they didn't wear much of anything the bare necessities is all they wore on a daily basis but it was embellished with all kinds of different imperfect beads yeah kim i or, also i kim, like oh do I'm we know sorry. what kind of fabric these uh, maggie coon pieces would have been on i don't know specifically on this one but most of the things were either on wool or on velvet okay that's what i thought or and with silk um usually on the out the trim mm -hmm. okay what i i like about the um loomed pieces there becky duchaine's well a, a few things it shows um geometric patterns were very much our patterns that we would use a lot um it's they're easier to do in loom work um than florals or anything, but um, we our geometrics were just kind of our our patterns for a lot of things, like even with the quill work with everything. Um, and oh, there was something else I was going to point out there, but loom work was wampum belts are loom work, so it's I mean it's one of our major sources of how our major styles of of beading and i've had people like complain that i try to teach loom work so much and i'm like but that's our main style of beading so that's why i try to push that one as much as possible but but yeah as you can see in the moccasins it's geometric patterns that are in a lot of our things that we do and the thing too about the moccasin here um the 1780 the the wine dot look at the color choices that they made it wasn't just the pattern, but the colors that they actually used on the quills, the reds, the yellows, the black, um, that's some pretty solid design color complementing each other there. Uh, that's, that's pretty good stuff. And then if you notice around the quill work, uh, there's some very sparse use of some seed beads yeah. all the way back to 1780. And I'd love to see these moccasins to see if those are actual uh, commercially produced beads that came from Europe, or if those are by chance some beads that were produced by nature. Yeah, they're beautiful. 
um, not to switch gears, but kind of switching gears um, about quill work, um, what we have in the works in the future. Um, there is a young man that is on one of the Facebook groups that I'm in and kind of Northeastern woodlands tribes or something like that. And he made a pair of moccasins, pecker toe moccasins with the pool um, kind of right above the toes, which is very specific to Wyandots in Ohio. So like mid, like 1820, something like that. And it had quill work on it and a few wampum beads on there. And so I was talking to him about it and I said, those look Wyandot. And he said, yeah, actually it is Wyandot. He's not Wyandot. He's um, some Haudenosaunee. I don't remember what he is, but he had been studying the pucker toe moccasins um, of the Wyandots and he did this. And I said, do you happen to teach quill work and um, those moccasins? And he said, absolutely, he does. So anyway, he lives uh, in the East. He, um, we decided probably in November that um, either October, November to come to Wyandot and um, spend some time with Chris and I about teaching us these things. And then we would have a class with him as well. Maybe spend several days just us and then have a class open and then hopefully we can do it via Zoom um, to open it up to everybody that wants to learn. But um, so we're working on it. We've, we've been in discussion with a few other people. Um, we had a class a few years ago with Monica Raphael. She is, uh, I think Potawatomi. I, I know she's um, Anishinaabe, but I can't remember exactly which one. And she is an amazing quill work artist. She just got back from Santa Fe Art Market and she did an amazing piece out there. And she always wins all these accolades, but she's done a class for us. And she, um, she did a birch bark um, quill work on in birch bark. And it was a great class. And uh, we had a great, a lot of people that learned quite a bit and they would be um, really good at kind of picking this up and running with it. But we just need to kind of keep the momentum once we start it. But Monica has said that she'll come back and do another class with this as well. So it's like I said, it's in the works and we will hopefully be getting it out to everybody in the next few months. So the quill work techniques could be used on anything. Yeah, there are different styles like on more of the plain style, like the Lakota and Dakotas, they do it on like rawhide. So there's I think they're I didn't mean that. Quill. You said birch bark and you said quill. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you could do bark. something modern with, say, straws. Um, well, they take the birch bark and they poke holes in it and put the quill into there. Does that make sense? Can you get no, that? But that's okay. You'll explain it to me in person. Um, there's a that turtle ornament over there somewhere. I'm sending Josh to fetch one, I'll turn the video on if we can find it. But it, the birch bark is what you put the quills on. I see, so it's and, I misunderstood. Right, okay. and like the, the Lakotas, Dakotas, those more the plain style, they put it on rawhide and different things. And we did a lot of the birch bark and on leather, like on these, on the moccasins, we did it onto the leather. So um, it's using quills onto that. And there, you can even do it. Um, I've seen it on like Palon, how I bead, how I do beading on like fabric stabilizer. I've seen them do quill work on that. And then you can attach that to leather later and it'd be a lot easier to do it that way. Or you could actually use the quills. Um, they're hollow. So you can yeah. cut the off and you can use those as long beads, almost like bugle beads um they're cylindrical so when I got these I was in college it was before the internet and I was sort of stymied because I expected them to be more like beads <laughs> I hadn't thought yeah. about it really since then. <laughs> but yeah I'm fascinated by it they're, they're far from beads yeah no I'm aware of that <laughs> Marilyn got stuck with one in her leg. Pick that up. upper leg and that, yeah, I, I will never leave that, live that down. And the clinic, um, <laughs> there's a couple of people at the clinic that look at me and laugh. 
So. <laughs> So, a lot of people, but, a lot of people don't know that the porcupine quill is not just like a needle. On the end of the quill are a number of barbs, and those barbs, when they go in, as Marilyn found out, they do not easily come out. And they keep they keep going in deeper I mean, and deeper and deeper. Yeah. Uh, if you ever watch, Larry, what my husband watches this all the time. Uh, Dr. Pole, he's a vet, and they're all the time these dogs get, because he lives up in, I think, Michigan, and they have dogs come in that have been attacked by, you know, gotten to a fight with porcupines, and they, it's important to get those dogs in because those quills can keep going in, and they will go in and puncture the brain, and the animals will die, so it's kind of, kind of a serious matter. Uh, but yet can be a comical when you get it stuck in your leg. <laughs> but Kim, I want to say I'm excited about that guy coming because I saw those moccasins and they are outstanding. I mean, I would never have thought they had just recently been made. They look something that should have been from a museum. Oh, yeah. He dyed them and everything to make them look like they've aged. Yeah. yeah, they were they were awesome. They were just awesome. So I'm excited about him coming and, and working with you guys. So, all right. Our, I didn't mean to kind of take over that, Lloyd, I'm sorry. Oh, no, this is... <laughs> This is what we talked about this morning. This is what we expected and what we wanted. So, yeah, Lloyd told me I couldn't start a beating class tonight. <laughs> <laughs> next time. Yeah, next when? time. Actually, actually, in what now? Uh, almost a week and a half. Yeah. Well, a week. Mm -hmm. a week. Yeah, a week, a week today. today. At noon. Or no, one o'clock. One. Mm -hmm. One o'clock. How many do we have registered now, Kim? Are you ready for this? I'm Are you ready. sitting down? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm, up, I'm up against the wall. How's that? 200. Ooh. Yay. Yay. Oh. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. I'm uh, Are, stressed can I, out. <laughs> can I hope and assume that all three nations and Wendaki are represented? Um. I don't think Wendaki is, Wendats are, I don't think it, there's anybody from them. Okay. Do you remember Joshua? No, okay. there's none. I think some are still having issues of crossing the border with COVID and stuff. Yeah, I was thinking maybe Chantal would make it, but no. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know uh, my friend Marsha, whose um, son, uh, married a lady from First Nations. She said a lot of people in Canada won't cross the border yet because mm -hmm. the whole COVID thing. Yeah, it's still. When we were up there in June, there was no problem whatsoever. Really? So, yeah. No problem of going back and forth now, but just a lot of Canadians will not cross the border. Sure, right. The, the problem's not probably. in Canada, the problem's in the United States. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Several of my peers have gone up uh, from EMS community. They've gone to Canada and getting into Canada is not the problem. It's getting back into the United States. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, let's I'm going to That's turn off. I'm going to turn off the recording for now. Um, I want to thank you guys. I have to slip out for a phone conference, but thank you.